when Laura and I finished the book Survivors, now just slightly over 20 years ago, I figured I had sort of paid the debt of stealing away this Armenian bride and polluting the bloodlines, those pure bloodlines. But actually, that was not how fate was going to happen, because in 2001, Lorna and I were invited to Rwanda, a country in Central Africa, a small country bounded by Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, uh, the Congo, or what was then known as Zaire, and uh, we were invited to a conference on genocides of the 20th century. Because this conference was held in 2001, there were no survivors of the Armenian genocide to represent that first genocide. And so, Lauren and I, because we'd written this book, we were invited to represent the Armenian genocide. And Lorna told the story of her father. She's going to very briefly tell you a little bit of that in a moment. And when she finished that presentation, there was a group of orphans, uh, orphans who had survived a terrible genocide in 1994 that began on April 7th of 94. And I think they were very sort of attracted to someone who, while not a survivor herself, but was a second generation survivor, um, they wanted to tell Lorna and myself their stories. And that began an odyssey which has now taken us back to Rwanda um, 16 times. And actually, we just returned a week ago um, as part of their 20th commemoration of the genocide. Now, I want to draw some parallels between the first genocide of the 20th century, the Armenian genocide, and the last genocide of the 20th century, the genocide against the Tutsis. First of all, while the numbers who were killed are not exactly the same, there still is a parallel. As you're well aware, uh, at least a million, a million and a half Armenians died in a several year period beginning in 1915. In Rwanda, in a very brief period of 100 days, at least 800,000 and maybe upwards of a million people were killed. Probably the most efficient genocide in all of human history. There's another parallel. Clearly, Armenians were a minority in the Ottoman Empire. They were singled out um, for a variety of reasons, uh, but certainly one of them was their upward mobility, uh, their strength as a people. In the case of Rwanda, it was again a minority of the two major tribes, Hutus and Tutsis. Tutsis were only about 15% of the population, and they were singled out. There's another parallel that has a great deal to do with the role of propaganda in any genocide. For Armenians, they were referred to as infidels, as gavors. For Tutsis, there was a huge propaganda campaign by the government that called them cockroaches and snakes. In both the Rwandan and the Armenian case, before a genocide can occur, you have to dehumanize the victims that you are going to kill. And another parallel between these two genocides is that there were prior massacres before the genocide occurred. In the Armenian case, 
in 1895-96, maybe 100,000 people were killed. The same thing occurred in Rwanda. Um, there were massacres against the Tutsis in 1959, 1963, 1973. Also, another really interesting parallel in both of these genocides is that huge numbers of people were killed in churches. In the case of the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, maybe half of those 800,000 to a million people were actually killed in churches because they fled there thinking that that was a place that they could have safety. Now there are some differences. Um, in the case of Rwanda, it was Christians killing Christians. 95% of the population of Rwanda in 1994 now are Christians. Clearly, that was a different situation in Turkey. It was Muslims that were killing Christians, although fundamentally it was not a religious genocide. Also, there were differences in these two genocides in the way people died. In the Armenian case, well, some people were killed outright. Many literally starved to death, or they died from disease, from dehydration, and other causes. In the case of the Rwanda genocide, People were killed very efficiently with machetes, with clubs, and they were killed in a hundred days. Actually, about two-thirds of those who were killed died in the first month. And I could also point to other differences, uh, such as the role of justice. In the Rwandan case, there was an international tribunal through the UN that has tried the perpetrators. Um, and then there have been localized courts that have tried the 100,000 perpetrators that were put in prison right at the end of the genocide. And maybe most significantly, there's a huge difference the Armenian Genocide to this day is denied by the Republic of Turkey. In the case of the Rwanda Genocide against Turkeys, uh, almost every country uh, globally has acknowledged that a genocide occurred. Uh, <clears throat> my job was to interview in Armenia the Armenian survivors. We started doing it together, but it became very apparent that the survivors felt much more comfortable speaking in Armenian. So that became my role to interview them. And most of the hundred, I would say the majority of them, actually were orphaned. If not losing both parents, they had at least lost one parent. And they were children at the time, very much the age of our children. So it was always, I always tried to imagine what it must have been like to be an orphan during and after the genocide. And I don't think I quite understood the challenges, the struggle, the trauma of being an orphan left alone in the world to fend for yourself until we went to Rwanda seven years after their genocide. And I met orphans. I met little girls, little boys, teenagers who were orphaned. And for the first time, I really saw, felt, understood what it was like for our parents and our grandparents to be orphaned. The first orphan we met was Naftal. And he reminded me so much of my father. He literally has become our son. He's our Rwandan son. And I will tell you about him a little bit. But first, let me go and tell you just the life of both Naftal and my father. My father had nine members in his family, and he's a sole survivor from a family of nine. His father was killed right before the genocide, as many of the influential men were in their towns. And then they were asked to leave the long deportation. 
Shortly after, about a week into the deportation, in my father's case, there was mass killing. There were killers all around that had, were uh, armed, and they began shooting. And many, many died. And miraculously, my father survived. And even more miraculously, he found that several of his family members had survived. So they were reunited. And the gendarmes appeared again, the ones who were supposed to protect them. And they continued the deportation. But that unity was very short-lived because my father and his sister, Sihun, an older sister, halfway through the deportation were separated from the rest of the crowd who continued on the deportation. And my father and his sister, Sihun, were taken to a Turkish home because she was to be the bride of the gendarme who was taking them to the Turkish home. The rest of the family, unfortunately, mother, two brothers, and older brother were all killed, as well as one sister that my father could never account for, and to his death wondered whether Arsha Luis was alive, and if so, where. But my father and his sister lived with this Turkish family for three years, and, then when, and it was a really a mixed kind of blessing. While he survived and he was loved by that family, and they really treated him like a son, he continued to see the atrocities around him, the killing, the deportation, the orphans trying to fend for themselves. So it was emotionally a very confusing time for him. But when the war ended, he and his sister were able to escape to an orphanage in Kharpers, and they relearned their language, they regained their Armenian identity, and also their Christian faith. They were, you know, they were forced to become Muslims, but they were converted back to their Christianity, which became my father's passion, of course, as he ended up becoming a pastor, a minister. And then, of course, all the orphanages were to leave the country. So once again, these poor orphans were taken to many different countries. My father ended up in Greece and then Lebanon. My aunt ended up in Lebanon. They were reunited again very short-lived when Masirun was 18 years old. Tragically, she got pneumonia and died. And so at age 16, my father was left completely alone in this world, in a new country, having lost his family, as many of you have the similar stories of your parents and grandparents. No home, no town, no country, all the institutions that gave him stability were all gone. He was left completely alone. You know what they say about genocide? They say genocide does not end with the killing. It continues. It continues lifelong and for generations. In the case of Naftal, he was a member of seven in his family. He too is a sole survivor. In his case, things happened very fast. When the genocide began, his father said, we are all going to be killed, so let's all hide. Heads of Households. 
These were young men and women who had come together to basically comfort each other, to share their food, and um, to try to make a new life. When Lord and I returned in 2001 from this conference where we had given our presentation, we kept thinking, what can we do? And of course, we could have found some charity that we could have perhaps written a check to, and that would have been worthwhile. But one day, just talking between ourselves, we thought, what if we write to them? Because Naftal and the officers of this orphan association at that point were, even though they'd had their educations interrupted, they were back in college or university. And I wrote to Naftal and I said, would you have any interest in doing an oral history study like Lorna and I did with Armenian survivors? They immediately jumped at this opportunity and we found some funding for them and uh, traveled back to Rwanda loaded with tape recorders and other equipment and um, Actually, to our joy and surprise, um, six months later, we have thousands of pages of transcripts of interviews that they had done with a hundred of their members. It was some sort of mirroring the project that we had done. And then um, a few years later, an association of widows uh, wanted to do the same thing. And again, we identified some funding for them to do a project. They did 60 interviews. More recently, Lorna and I have worked with an NGO, a non-governmental organization that was created by a survivor after the genocide, and we've done 100 videotape interviews. So we're really in sort of the last stages of now writing a book on the Rwanda genocide. Now our focus in this book has been on the issue of trauma or what psychologists sometimes refer to as PTSD, namely post-trauma syndrome disorder. And uh, after any crisis, whether it be a flood, an earthquake, people returning from war, or in the case of a genocide, it's predictable that people are going to exhibit different symptoms of trauma. For example, they're in all likelihood going to have difficulties with sleep, with insomnia. They oftentimes are in a sort of flashback of revolving memories of the tragedy that they just experienced, they keep just sort of going around and around in their head. They oftentimes are involved in what psychologists sometimes refer to as dissociation, almost a kind of numbness where they tune out the world. And so what we have found in a very interesting way in Rwanda is that we've started to understand the trauma that happens after a genocide in a way that I don't think we really comprehended what Armenian survivors went through. Now let me just briefly uh, say something about some of the parallels between the ways in which trauma was dealt with in this first and last genocide of the 20th century. And I think it's probably familiar to you that in the Armenian case, there was an enormous outpouring worldwide of assistance, of intervention, of orphanages, of organizations like Nearest Relief, which were formed. I was looking up some statistics recently, and between April 1917 and October 1918, donations were averaging $500,000 a month 
to support those who survived the Armenian genocide.